They had made it to the very top of society, proved that they were the best that humanity had to offer. It is important to note that Darwin's famous Origin of Species is actually subtitled Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Not surprisingly, the Royal Society, a scientific institution dedicated to the improvement of natural knowledge, picked up on these new ideas and promoted Darwin heavily. Being a creation of the British monarchy, the Royal Society was obviously in favor of promoting the idea of the genetic superiority of the royal family. Science itself was being positioned to replace the old religious appeal of the divine right of kings to rule over the inferior masses. Darwin himself stated, elite status is prima facie evidence of evolutionary superiority. Through scientism, science as religion, Darwinism could in fact bring about social change. Social Darwinism would manifest itself as eugenics. To eugenicists, the masses were cattle, with Galton calling eugenics the science of improving the stock. The rise of scientism spawned the widespread proliferation of eugenics as it reached American shores at the turn of the century. The Eugenics Record Office in Cold Springs Harbor, New York went to work amassing hundreds of thousands of family pedigrees for genetic research. They also lobbied for state sterilization acts and other eugenic legislation. In 1899, Henry Clay Sharp, a prison physician, began sterilizing degenerate prisoners. And later in 1907, he was a key advocate for a law in Indiana which was passed mandating the compulsory sterilization of degenerates throughout the state. In 1921, the American Eugenic Society was formed and began propaganda campaigns which included the promotion of eugenics in churches, schools, and state fair exhibitions. Funding for American eugenics came from the Carnegie, Harriman, and Rockefeller families, among others. Eugenics was being accepted as a genuine form of science. Social Darwinism made strong advances toward a world in which scientism would fulfill Galton's dream of having eugenics be the religion of the future. But a major setback occurred at the end of World War II. It was discovered that American eugenics had been a major influence on Hitler's final solution. In 1934, Rudolf Hess had stated that National Socialism is nothing but applied biology. Hitler had only wanted to preserve the best German stocks and elevate them to a dominant position within society. It was at this point in eugenics history that a crucial move had to be made in order to hide eugenics from the now aware masses of humanity. Prominent eugenicist Julian Huxley stepped up and offered a solution. He simply invented a new word to replace eugenics, that term being transhumanism, which he defined as a need for mankind to realize the importance of steering the direction of its own evolution. Yes, eugenics was one of the original aspects of transhumanism and it is no surprise as Julian was the grandson of Thomas Henry Huxley who had been a president of the Royal Society and one of the most well-known advocates of Darwinism in its early days. Julian, being properly raised, was educated at Oxford, his specialty being evolutionary biology. He went on to many high-level positions which included the titles of Vice President and President of the British Eugenic Society which of course had the task of removing undesirable variants from the human gene pool. Julian Huxley has said the following of eugenics. The lowest strata are reproducing too fast. Therefore, they must not have too easy access to relief or hospital treatment, lest the removal of the last check on natural selection should make it too easy for children to be produced or to survive. Long unemployment should be a ground for sterilization. 
Transhumanism was born out of humanism, which is yet another form of scientism, characterized by its faith in the power of human beings to create their own future. Yet another clever rationalization for eugenics as the creative force behind man-made evolution. No one doubts the wisdom of managing the germ plasm of agricultural stocks, so why not apply the same concept to human stocks? Among Huxley's many distinguished positions, one which stands out was that of being the first ever Director General of UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. The job of the organization being to bring culture to the third world. Culture being the worldwide spread of eugenic philosophy. It will be important for UNESCO to see that the eugenic problem is examined with the greatest care, and that the public mind is informed of the issues at stake, so that much that now is unthinkable may at least become thinkable. Darwinism is a religion to the global power elite, who do believe themselves superior to the masses of humanity. Humanism and transhumanism were clever disguises created specifically so that global eugenics operations could be carried out without being noticed. Insiders referred to their continued work as crypto-eugenics, as they were carried out covertly. Prominent among this crowd was the grandson of Charles Darwin, Charles Galton Darwin, a distinguished fellow of the Royal Society and president of the British Eugenic Society. In 1952, his book The Next Million Years was published. In it, he describes five great revolutions throughout human history, the fifth of which had not yet happened, but when it did, it would kickstart the next million years of human evolution. This fifth revolution would involve using science to alter human nature itself, possibly creating a race of supermen. This, of course, is the familiar transhumanist ideal of the posthuman. If man is really a tame animal, there is no reason why breeds of man should not be created. Although, Galton Darwin was skeptical of this point, because he believed that man is untamable. He goes on to illustrate this point with a hypothetical story of an island in which a visionary director gathers a variety of highly skilled people and institutes a social Darwinistic breeding program. Members of the island breed with each other based on their unique talents, intelligence, or beauty. For instance, two athletic people would give birth to a new generation of superior athletes. The population would become tame, but the island's director would not. Though it might conceivably be possible to tame the majority of mankind, this could only be done by leaving untamed a minority of the population. Moreover, this minority would have to be the group possessing the most superior qualities of all. The message is clear. Darwin is legitimizing the elite ruling class which he himself is a part of. The third tenet of Darwinism that sexual instinct causes conflict is also addressed in this book. Galton Darwin offers up a scientific solution. With the knowledge of the various sexual hormones, it might also become possible to free the majority of mankind from the urgency of sexual impulse so that they could live contented, celibate lives. He goes on and on about how the struggle for survival will cause global conflict and that eugenics operations will be a necessity to control population growth. He applauds China for its long history of civil services, which predate those of Europe by millennia. China is described as the model type of civilization for a world which will ultimately be unified through technology. Galton Darwin has a fascination with insects, stating that humans should resemble workers in an anthill. 